Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, specialty recruitment uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Howes and I'll be chairing this evening's webinar. Uh, so today we're going to have a presentation on, on the 2023 uh, recruitment process. Uh, we have uh, two of our national recruitment managers here to uh, give you an overview of the process uh, and then answer any questions that you may have. We have received a few uh, advanced questions, but please feel free to add further questions to the live Q&A as we go uh, through. Uh, tonight, for obvious reasons, we're not able to sort of answer individual questions on, on an open webinar, uh, but we will ensure we answer every question uh, and every question will be published on our website as we did last year uh, over the next uh, few days. So if we do run out of time, I think we've got about an hour for today's uh, webinar. If we do run out of time, don't worry, we will capture those questions uh, and answer them all uh, before applications open. OK, without further ado, I'll hand you across to uh, Claire Wright, the National Recruitment Manager, who will take you through uh, the uh, the application process. Over to you, Claire. Thanks, John. Good evening, everybody. Um, so over the next sort of 15, 20 minutes, I'm just going to take you through the process for 2023 recruitment um, and hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have. So the general principles for this year's recruitment process is that you should all be aware of the sele selection process in place before you apply. Where application numbers exceed interview capacity, shortlisting processes may be adopted by specialty. So due to an increase in numbers over the last few years, we're no longer able to interview all eligible applicants as we were previously. If self-assessment is used um, by the specialty you're applying for and the score achieved contributes to part of the final selection score, your evidence must be verified. So there'll be a separate process for that. It won't be undertaken during the interview itself, but you'll be given instructions on how to partake in that process. There won't be any face to face in person interviews for the duration of the 2023 selection process and all interviews will be undertaken digitally, either using a single panel interview or where possible multiple mini interviews, but still online. So the main changes for this year's recruitment process, we have removed um, intercalated degrees from person specifications and scoring criteria. And the reason for that is around widening access and participation. So we're aware that some universities offer intercalated degrees, some don't. We have a lot of overseas applicants where um, intercalated degrees are not part of their medical degree. And so therefore we felt in the interest of fairness, we shouldn't be giving points um, for having an intercalated degree. That said, the learning that you get as part of doing the intercalation will still count. So such as research skills, publications, presentations, anything that comes from that period of intercalation will still count elsewhere in the scoring criteria. So it hasn't been a wasted time um, if you have undertaken that. We've also decided to remove named courses from scoring criteria. So we took the step last year to take them out of person specifications. They're now out of scoring criteria as well. So you will no longer be scored against specific courses. There may be generic um, requirements in there for you to have undertaken. Uh, for example, if you're applying for emergency medicine, courses related to emergency medicine, but they won't be spe specific. So you won't have to spend huge amounts of money undertaking courses to get points on the scoring criteria. We've removed the need to prove aptitude for practical skills, for example, manual dexterity from the person specs. And the reason for that is that as we're not doing face to face skill stations um, at the moment, there is no way of proving that through the selection process. So therefore, we've removed it from the person specifications. Core surgical training um, is going to use the multi specialty recruitment assessment for the first time this year as part of their uh, selection process and that will be used for shortlisting and for 10% of the overall selection score. That has to go to our program board for final sign off um, on Thursday of this week. Um, but it's been through all the other governance routes so far and has had approval for that to happen for this year. And the final thing we've changed this year is around the attainment date for membership exams. So one of the things that we noted from person specifications is that different specialties ask for membership exams at different times. And it was particularly confusing where um, specialties had multiple entry routes from different specialties, each requiring a different time for the exam to have been completed. So for this year, we've said that all membership exams have to have been completed and passed by the offer deadline for the recruitment round that that specialty is advertising in. So for specialties that advertise in round one, you'll need to have completed the full membership exam required by the 30th of March 2023. 
for specialties advertising round two, the date's the 20th of April 2023. And um, for specialties advertising round three, which is our autumn round four, February start dates, um, you'll need to have passed the exam by the 23rd of October 2023. So each specialty has a lead recruiter and they're responsible for recruitment to the specialty. The lead recruiter is always um, an HEE local office who recruits to all posts in each of the participating nations. The applications will be made through the lead recruiter advertisement, regardless of which region you wish to work in, and they'll be able to answer specifics about the specialty selection process. It's really important that you familiarise yourself with who the lead recruiter is for the specialty that you um, want to apply for, and you can get that information from the Oriel website. And so we open for 2023 recruitment with round one uh, on the 2nd of November. And this is specialties generally at CT1 and ST1 level, but there are some run through specialties that will recruit at ST3 or even ST4 within that round. So the advertisements appear on the 2nd of November. Um, the applications will open the following day from 10 a.m. and they will close at 4 p.m. on the 1st of December. 2022. It's really important that you um, allow enough time to complete your application because it's always busy in the last few days and I think every year we have 60% of applicants trying to submit in the last 48 hours. So despite all the performance testing that we put the system through, it will slow down if there are 10,000 people trying to submit their application form at the same time. So make sure you allow plenty of time. Interviews for round one specialties will be held between the 3rd of January and the 17th of March and initial offers for the specialty will be released by no later than the 30th of March um, 2023, but some specialties may release earlier if they've completed their selection by then. So round two, which is um, ST3, ST4 specialties, they will advertise on the 16th of November and applications will open on the 17th of November, closing on the 8th of December. The interview window for round two is from the 3rd of January to the 14th of April and initial offers will be released by no later than the 20th of April. As with round one, it could be earlier, especially as are ready before then. So in terms of planning and making your application, it's really important that you decide which specialties you wish to apply for. We have competition ratios um, on our website for previous recruitment rounds, which give you an idea of what the competition has been in specialties previously. It doesn't give you an idea of what's going to happen this year, but it will give you a historical idea. The website I've put there is our new website, but it doesn't actually go live until next week. So in the meantime, if you use the old specialty training website, you'll find all the competition ratios on there. You can apply to as many specialties as you like, subject to eligibility, but you must review the person specs before you apply to ensure that you are eligible. It's really important that you read all supporting information before commencing your application, including application guidance. Now there's generic application guidance that covers all specialties, but specialties will also release their own specialty specific in relation to that particular process. So it's really important that you find both of those um, bits of guidance and read them all. And all applications will be made through the um, Oriel recruitment portal and the address for Oriel is on screen. When doing your application, it's really important that you pay attention to demonstrating the requirements of the person specification, as that's ultimately what you will be assessed at. As I've already said, ensure you allow plenty of time to complete the application. Familiarise yourself with a deadline. If you're applying for a specialty that requires you to undertake self-assessment as part of the application form, ensure that you choose the appropriate option for you. It, each option in self-assessment generates a score. Um, and later in the process, you'll be asked to provide documentary evidence to, to justify the score that you've given yourself. So it's important that you score something that you can actually go on to justify later on. Ensure you submit everything that needs to be submitted at the time of application. And again, I advise that you have a look to see what's needed before um, you start your application, particularly if you're applying um, through a route that requires you have a certificate of entry to readiness for entry to specialty training, so a crest form, um, because your application, if you need one of those, won't let you submit without it. Double check your application before submission. Mistakes cannot be corrected later. There is no mechanism to go back into your application form, either from yourself or from the recruitment office at a later date. So double check it before you um, press the submit button. And finally, ensure that you access your Oriel account regularly throughout the selection process. There are lots of time based activities as part of recruitment, so offers have a time associated with them um, when you're advised to submit things for self assessment, all that kind of stuff. You'll have a deadline by which you need to do it. So it's really important that you access your Oriel account regularly, although emails will also be sent to you because they go in external to the system. There's no guarantee that they 
can be delivered because of firewalls. So the, the most accurate way to ensure that you're getting all of the information that's sent to you is to go into your Oriel account. So the multi-specialty recruitment assessment um, is used for I think 10 or 12 specialties at CT1 and ST1 level. So it's a computer-based test. It consists of two components, professional dilemmas and clinical problem solving. Applicants who are applying to specialties that use the MSRA will be sent details on how to book a sitting of the MSRA after the application window has closed and after long listing for that specialty has taken place. So if you have applied to a specialty that sits the MSRA, don't worry, you don't need to do anything at this point in time. You will be contacted by the recruitment office around about mid-December. So don't worry about if you haven't heard anything before then. If you're applying to uh, general practice or core psychiatry, your um, appointment will be solely on the basis of the MSRA. There is no interview process. Um, that's completely the MSRA, nothing else. But other specialties use the MSRA to contribute to a percentage of their final selection. So the test is flexible and it allows specialties to use it in different ways. And each specialty that uses it does use it in a different way. Different percentages count towards their final selection score, that kind of thing. You only need to sit the MSRA, MSRA once. So even if you're applying to multiple specialties that use it as part of your selection process, you don't need to sit it multiple times. Just one sitting will cover you for all of those specialties. It's been shown to be a reliable and valid way of assessing a large number of candidates in a standardised way with limited clinical and administrative resource. And that's why a number of specialties have chosen to use it as part of their process. This slide here shows the specialties that will be using um, the MSRA in 2023. You can see I've added core surgical training on there who uh, plan to use it for the first time this year, subject to final approval on Thursday of this week. Self-assessment verification. Um, so this is a process that's been in use for probably the last couple of years. So it, it, it was brought in around the pandemic times um, because we couldn't do portfolio assessment because we weren't um, seeing candidates face to face. So self-assessment allows for you to score yourself in your application form, but then present evidence to show what you've done. So a bit like the old portfolio station, um, but done virtually. So. As I said already, evidence to support the scores that you give yourself in your application form will need to be verified. And if you're applying to a specialty that uses self-assessment, you will be sent login details for the self-assessment portal. This is the, the area where you will be asked to upload all of your documents at a particular moment in time. The deadline for submission will be set, so it's important and really essential that you engage with the process because once the deadline is passed, you won't have the opportunity to upload anything um, to support your score. Each specialty will determine tags for evidence. Um, so when you do the self-assessment, you'll realise that it's split into different domains and they will ask you to upload your evidence against a particular domain or tag. Some specialties might even give you um, a maximum number of pieces of evidence that you can upload. But as I say, you need to look at guidance to understand exactly what the requirements are. When you upload your evidence attached to the, the uh, particular tag, after the deadline has passed, assessors will be given access to review and score your evidence. Um, your scores could be increased, they could be decreased or they could remain the same. And you'll be informed of your verified score by the recruitment office and you'll have the opportunity to appeal that if you feel that you've been incorrectly scored. There will be certain parameters that you need to um, fit within and the recruitment team will make you aware of those. You cannot um, upload additional evidence for the appeals process. So the evidence that you, you submit initially will be the evidence that will also be used in appeals. So training offers. So um, if you're successful through recruitment and you ultimately get a, an offer of a training post, this offer will be made through Oriel um, based on your rank and your stated geographical preferences. Offers received in any other way are not valid. So you, you must check Oriel for your offer. You won't be offered a post if you haven't ranked a, a uh, anything in your preferences or even if you leave some geographical preferences out you'll never receive an offer for something that you haven't ranked even if it means that you are bypassing somebody lower than you gets an offer instead. You'll be given 48 hours to respond to your offer and you'll be able to accept or decline it and up until the whole deadline you'll have the opportunity to hold as well. The 48 hours is um, exclusive of weekends but will be inclusive of bank holidays. If you choose to hold an offer you can only hold one at any one time. So if you hold one offer, you then receive an offer for another specialty and you try to hold that as well. Your initial offer that you held will be declined. So it's important that you can only do one at a time. Once you accept a post, you'll receive no further offers from any specialty within the recruitment round and you'll be automatically withdrawn from um, all of the specialty applications. 
If you decline a post, it means that you won't receive any further offers from that specialty, even if one of your preferred posts become available at a later date, but you may continue to receive offers from other specialties. So I think if you, the important message there is that if you don't want a particular geographical location, don't put it in your preferences. So you never have to decline a post that you don't want. You can also upgrade your offers. Um, so if you get offered something that isn't your first choice within a particular specialty, you can opt in to be upgraded into one of your preferred options should they become available at a later date. Um, so I've given you a slide here which gives you an idea of application number. So we've had quite a big increase in application numbers in the last few years. Um, you'll see that between August 2020 applications and August 2022, we had almost well, 10 and a half thousand more applications. Um, but the post available has also increased slightly as well. So we are expecting another increase this year um, if the trend continues. So it's important to note that and know that the competition is high. So think about that when making your application choices. This slide shows how um, applicants behaved in terms of number of applications submitted in 2022. So the big blue blocks that you can see are the applicants that only submitted one application within that recruitment round. So for round one for CT1, ST1 specialty, that's 65%-ish of applicants only submitted one application and 70 odd percent for round two, so your ST3, ST4 applications. What's important to note is that most applicants don't submit many more than two applications. So you can see on both that we're up to sort of almost 90% on round two and 85% on round one. So applicants do tend to limit their choices, um, but it's just worth remembering what the competition is, so I can't really stress that enough. And then finally, um, I've just put a further information slide on there. So the specialty recruitment website, I've given you the new link because that is the one where all the 2023 information will be. The new website goes live on the 18th of October, but in the meantime, all of the 2023 person specifications are, are still on the old website, so the specialty training one. Uh, specialty specific websites will also exist and they will give you information specifically about the, the individual processes and it's also worth looking at rural college websites because they often have information on recruitment as well. Thank you very much. Thank you Claire. I think uh, that's the end of the presentation so we will go to some questions that are, are in the chat. Uh, the, the first question I, I have uh, is uh, when will the self-assessment for core surgery training be released? Uh, Claire, I think there's some further webinars on core surgery, is that correct? Yes, uh, there's two webinars planned for core surgery recruitment, one on the 31st of October, which is around the use of the MSRA, um, and one on the 2nd of November, which is around the portfolio verification. So there'll be more information available then. Okay, thank you. Uh, vacancies for ST3 ONG last year, continued to increase up until July uh, with some doctors unable to join due to visa issues. What are the solutions this year? So each year we do ask specialties to put as many of their vacancies they know obviously to ensure they're all there before offers are, are made, but every year we do get late, late vacancies. Not as many as we had last year, I think last year was slightly uh, different due to COVID extensions and a few other reasons, but there's always a few that uh, are, are after initial offers uh, and what we try and do is fill as many vacancies as possible uh, and offer as many applicants so we try and get as many uh, across as we, we we can at the start but there was always a few last year we're, we're hoping was an anomaly where vast majority of posts sh should should already uh, be there uh, these is uh, somewhat out of our control we work very closely with the home office because uh, each nation issues visas on behalf of all appointable applicants uh, and we are working with them to make sure they, they hit their, their their service level agreements on, on responding to visas again last year was difficult with the ukrainian family visas also uh, taking priority it did mean some visas were, were delayed but we're, we're hoping uh, for, for, for better in 2023 uh, moving down uh, when will the assessment for the TNO uh, ST3 specialty be released? Uh, I'm assuming we don't have a date on the webinar, but we can that'd be one question we can ask answer uh, on the website afterwards. So I think it's I think the guy, so I understand the question right. It's asking about um, when their self assessment will be released. So it's going through final approval at the moment. It's normal to release it around the time that the um, adverts go live. So you should expect to see it in the next probably two or three weeks time. 
Uh, thanks, Claire. Uh, another one linked to self-assessment and MSRA. Uh, will we upload our self-assessment before or after the MSRA if it goes ahead? So I think it depends on the specialty. Um, so I think for, so for, if I'm assuming it means core surgery, so for core surgery, it will be used as a shortlisting tool. Um, so people that get through the MSRA will then be contacted to upload stuff for self-assessment. So you won't be having to upload things unnecessarily. You'll know that you're part of the, the ongoing recruitment process. So you're not doing it if you don't have, if it's not needed. So that's for surgery. Others might be slightly different, but that'll be outlined in their, their, their guidance. Yeah. OK, uh, I'm an international medical graduate and I have a CREST form for 2021. Will that be valid for this year? Uh, Alana, do you want to answer this one? Yep, can do. Yes, it will be valid for this year. OK, that was a, a, an easy answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, interesting question here. I'm applying for an academic uh, clinical fellow in TNO. Will I need to still sit the MSRA? Uh, Lara or Alana, do you know that one? So if you, it depends on what level you're applying for. I'm assuming it's from the question that you're probably applying for a TNOST1 ACF, um, in which case the the relevant benchmarking specialty would be core surgery because TNO doesn't point on its own. And so therefore, yes, you will have to sit the MSRA as it will be part of the, the overall core surgical selection process. OK, thank you. Uh, We've got a few questions uh, on self-assessment. I think we've already answered. Uh, when will the MSRA be sat? Did you give the, the dates for the MSRA? No, so it's uh, in January. I think off the top of my head, it's probably the second and third week of January. Uh, Alana, did you have something further on that one? No, OK. Uh, if you get an offer, can you hold it for the following year? Uh, Claire? So you can only defer um, your entry for uh, statutory reasons. So if you're on maternity leave, paternity leave, parental leave, um, sick leave, that kind of thing, you can't just defer it for the following year. You will need to, to reapply again, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Uh, with the increased number of applications for, uh, and increased medical student places, are there plans to increase the number of posts? Uh, so. I can answer that one broadly. We we are expanding training posts for, for this year, uh, so I think there's going to be an extra thousand posts in specialty training this year, uh, with further expansions uh, in 24. Uh, it, it, it would be so. We are looking to expand, and that that workforce planning is is underway even for 2025. Uh, onwards. So yeah, yes, we are looking to expand. I, I, I still think specialty training will be competitive as it always has been, but we, we are cognizant of, of needing to increase uh, training posts because obviously I I England is 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 under doctored. Uh, well, four nations are under doctored, so we are looking to increase a number of uh, posts. Uh, Claire. Sorry, I just wanted to come back in on, on something um, earlier. So we, we mentioned about the, the webinars for core surgery being the 31st of October and the 2nd of November. Sorry, I wasn't clear. So the 31st of October and the 2nd of November will give you more in-depth detail, but the likelihood is that, well, in fact, definitely information relating to how the surgical selection score will be made up will be released before then because applications open at the beginning of November. So you'll need to be aware of that before then. So although there'll be more detail from 31st of October, once the decision is made finally on Thursday that the MSRA will be used, there will be more information available to you pretty soon after that. So I'm sorry if that wasn't clear earlier. So how how is that and is that purely for core surgery, Claire? So how it will be used in core surgery will be published after the decision is finally ratified yeah. on Thursday? Yes. OK. Uh, Thank you. Is there a plastic surgery webinar? And if so, when is it happen happening? There's not one purely for plastic surgery. OK, thank you. If we complete MRCS Part A in January and have Part B in May, will we still be eligible to apply for ST3? Claire? No, unfortunately not, because you would have to have the full um, MRCS by the April date that I outlined in the in the presentation, I think 20th of April. So the, if you sit the um, 
NRCS in May, you won't get the result until June, so that's too late, I'm afraid. Thank you for that clarity. Uh, what happens to the over 20,000 applicants who may not get an offer? So Claire, can you just confirm, was it applications or applicants? Uh, was that 20,000? Claire? It was applications, so um, that wasn't unique applicants. So um, as I said, 65% of CT1s and about 70% of ST3, ST4 applicants only apply to one specialty. But with the, the crossover of the specialty, obviously you can only ever accept one. Um, so the, the actual number of applicants is, is less than the number of applications. OK, uh, I think I'm just making sure I'm not missing any questions out. Uh, can I have a crest from outside the NHS? Uh, or is it better to get it from within the NHS? Uh, Claire? So you, you can get a crest from anywhere in the world. Um, if you have it signed by somebody not in the NHS and who isn't currently registered with the GMC, then you will need to provide evidence of their standing with um, a statutory regulatory body. So it could be from anywhere in the world, but you would have to show the equivalent of whatever the GMC is in that country, and that'd be the, your responsibility to get that evidence to provide with the crest. As long as you meet the requirements for three months whole time equivalent in the three and a half years prior to the start date of the post, any post anywhere in the world can be used for a crest. OK, we have a question uh, around, again, MSRA and core surgery and it being only sort of three months notice. Uh, people who have been studying for a long time in the MSRA for non-SC, non-core surgery posts, could they have a, a, an advantage where candidates who've been building that portfolio for CST for a number of years could be at a disadvantage due to the, the little notice for the MS, MSRA exam? How would we answer that one, Claire Alana? So I think it's important to remember that you mentioned there that people have sat the MSRA for other specialties um, previously. So I think last year, 35% of applicants to core surgery also sat the MSRA for other specialties. Everyone who's applied will also have been working on their portfolio because at all points, everybody who's planning to apply for CST will have been expecting to have to do self-assessment verification. So everyone's in that boat. What I would say about the MSRA is that the expectation is that you shouldn't have to revise for it. It's a situational judgment test, which you shouldn't need to revise for at all. Um, and the clinical problem solving part is set at F2 doctor level. So the level you're at now, it's generic. It's not um, specialty specific. So it shouldn't be anything that you shouldn't be able to do. It's general um, competencies, really. So you shouldn't be needing to revise for months for it. So I appreciate it's probably quite worrying that with three months to go, but I, we, we took this decision um, based on the fact that the application numbers mean that less people can ultimately be interviewed and that this is the fairest way to make sure that people can progress through the recruitment process because we don't feel that um, the previous process was that people would do a self-assessment score and then they'll be shortlist on, shortlisted out on an unverified score and only a certain number would be invited to upload documents. This gives a verified way of getting down to that number that then gets verified, which obviously previously we didn't have. So we actually think this is the fairer process for um, applicants to call surgery. Thanks, Claire. So we, we listened to feedback in regards to the self-assessment uh, last year, but but also in speaking to our surgical colleagues at the, at the college uh, and, and the recruitment committee, it's around in creating the capacity to interview as many people as we can. And we're hoping to have interview slots for over 1,200 uh, I think applicants for for core surgery. That would not be the case if we had to go back to verified self-assessment scores where that clinical time would also be needed to to verify those. So we are trying to maximise getting as many interviews uh, uh, as possible, but I understand it is uh, a change, relatively short notice uh, and still subject to for final ratification at, at the programme board on, on Thursday. Someone was asking around the evidence for the MSO rate. I believe there is information already on the website, but I think we, we can commit to putting further information on the website, especially around the, the surgical evidence that you've just highlighted. Uh, Claire? Yeah, so we, we, as you mentioned, we've already put a statement on the website about the, the governance route for and the benefits of using the MSRA. What we do have is we have um, some data uh, around the people that sat the MSRA, uh, I think the last three years, certainly I think 2022, 
2021 and it might be 2020 and 2019 and um, so people who applied the core surgery who also sat the msra for a different specialty and the correlation between their performance in the msra and their performance at selection um, so we have some data around that we are going to publish that uh, in the coming weeks to show you how the decision was made okay and um, someone's just asking for clarity on whether they're saying it will definitely be used or is it still to be confirmed so the proposal from the core surgery training committee is to use the msra for 2023 there is a final ratification from the four nations on this thursday uh, and after that date we will will 100 confirm whether that is now uh, happening uh, the msra and core surgery but uh, by likelihood it it, it 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 will be uh Will you refund fees out of MSRA question banks if you reverse the decision to use CST? Uh, uh, Claire? So one thing I will say is that nobody should be paying for MSRA question banks. The, the, there are no paid question banks that are written by people who write MSRA questions. We're aware that there are lots of people that sell MSRA question banks, but they have nothing to do with writing the actual questions. So please do not pay for any of those questions. When you're invited to attend for the MSRA exam, you'll be given a link um, that you can look in advance on. It's actually on the GPNRO website. There are some sample questions on there and some ideas of how the questions are written. That's the stuff that you should be looking at and that's free of charge. So we would not um, advocate you paying for any sample questions. OK, uh, there's another question on MSRA being validated, but I think you pick that answer up and we'll publish that, that information uh, on, on the website. Uh, a question around offers. If you hold or accept an offer in one specialty, will you not be able to receive uh, offers from other specialties? Uh, Claire? So if you if you hold a, uh, an offer, you will continue to receive offers from other specialties. It's only if you if you accept a, an offer, then you will not receive any other offers in that recruitment round at all. But if you hold or if you decline, you will carry on receiving offers from other specialties. Thank you. Will there be any uh, run through paediatric surgery post this year. Claire, is it too early for that information? Yeah, so indicative numbers on the number of training posts per specialties will be published when applications go live. As we mentioned earlier, they, they are somewhat subject to change as we try and increase the number that are available and it all depends on uh, trainees completing, etc. Uh, so there's always a slight moving uh, number, but those will be confirmed obviously before offers are made. But we try and give you both competition ratios for the last few years because generally they, they, they tend to be similar uh, and those that we're, we're, we're predicting uh, to be vacant for, for 2023. Is there a webinar for emergency medicine? Don't think there's a specific one for emergency medicine. Uh, what specialties are using the mini interview format this year? And is that for CT1 or ST3, ST4? So we know that anaesthetic CT1 will be using the multi mini interviews um, and we've had a few other specialty medicine specialties for ST3 um, that have said they've they will be using um, the multi interview format, but we're still um, awaiting answers off other specialties. OK, thank you, Alana. I just had some question whether there'll be all interviews will be face to face this year and I think that everything's face to face. Are there any exceptions this year? Uh, or in person. There'll be nothing in person, nothing, nothing. at all. Okay. Uh, we have an applicant who's eligible for both core surgery and ST3. Uh, is there an issue if they apply for, for, for both? No, if you meet the person specification for both, you can you are and you're eligible, you can apply for both. It won't affect you at all. Okay. Uh, uh, I've completed core medical training too, but then went to do a PhD and have got all the competencies for ST4. Uh, will I be eligible to apply for an ST4? Will it be an IM3? So I think that what I'd advise you to do is to look at the person specifications. I have a feeling that if you have done core medicine previously, you have to do top up IMY3 um, to get the competencies. but. As I say, I would advise that you look at the person spec for the specialty that you're looking to apply for um, and the guidance from the lead recruiter, because that would be the best place for you to find that answer. 
OK, uh, if someone is subject to a fitness to practice investigation, uh, may he or she continue to apply for specialty training? As part of the application process, um, you can make a declaration on fitness to practice and submit evidence um, where appropriate, and that will be picked up by the recruitment teams. But you can um, carry on with your application. There's nothing stopping you from applying. Again, with core surgery, what percentage does it account for the overall application? Uh, Claire, was that 10 percent? Yeah, 10 percent. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, can we improve the MSRA scores in subsequent years or is it just a one time exam? So you, you can sit it. Um, you only need to sit it once per year, but if you apply this year, you don't get a post and you apply again next year. Um, you'll need to sit it again. If you if you're applying for general practice, there is an option to transfer your score over from one year to the next. But for all other specialties, you'd need to resit it the following year. And I think if the specialty you're applying for um, advertises twice within the same year, which some do, I think you can choose to resit the the MSRA if you want to. Or carry your score over. It's someone's asking as it's meant to be F2 expected knowledge. Is there a syllabus? Uh, I think they've heard that. Previous exams have been very paediatric dominated and perhaps most F2s would not know that. Uh, so you mentioned there were test questions and test examples that are MSRA available, uh, Claire? So there are some um, sample questions available uh, on the GPNRA website. Uh, I, we have question writers from each of the specialties that participate within the um, MSRA. So I gave all the specialties earlier. But I don't think I think you'll find there may be the odd paediatric question in there, but there certainly won't be dominated by paediatric questions because none of the specialties that use MSRA are paediatric. OK, uh, will there be any new IST posts this year? Uh, run through programmes for surgery. Uh, Claire, you're shaking your heads. So is that a, is that a, a no? Yeah, so the pilot's been put on hold for now, I understand. So there were none this year um, and there won't be any for 2023 either. I think the evaluation of the pilot has to happen before um, that can be taken forward any further. OK, uh, is there going to be a specific webinar for internal medicine training? So I think the only specialty that's planning um, webinars, as far as I'm aware, are core surgery. And I think that's because obviously there's quite a significant change to the process this year. For all other specialties, the, the process is going to be very similar to what it has been um, in the last couple of years. So I would advise that if there isn't a webinar as such, that you have a look at the guidance documents that are released by the specialty um, that will be specific to that process. And if you have any questions, there will be contact details on there of where you can go to to get further information. And if in doubt, you can always come into the, the MDRS team and we can um, forward your questions on to get responses for you. OK, question around holding an offer. How long can you hold an offer? What's the time frame? So the um, each recruitment round has a, a hold deadline within the round. So I'm just going to get the dates up in front of me here. So if you're applying in round, oh, I haven't got the date in front of me. Um, it's normally, I think, around uh, Aprilish time, mid to late April for for round one, and it's normally. Um, OK, so 4th of April for round one, and I think it's the beginning of May for, for round two. But if you do hold an offer, then you need to make sure that you go back into Oriel and make a firm decision on it before that whole deadline passes. So it's it's the 4th of April for round one and 25th of April for round two at 1 p.m. on both days. But you, if you don't go back in, you just leave your, your offer as held. Once that deadline passes, the, the Oriel system will automatically assume that you don't want that offer and it will decline you. So if you do hold an offer, you can hold it for quite a amount of time. You can change it so you can choose to decline one and hold another one as it comes along. But after the whole deadline you or at the whole deadline, you need to have made sure that you've made a firm decision on that offer. So if you want it, you go back in and you click accept. Otherwise, you you will lose that offer. Thanks, Claire. Uh... Will MLCSA be removed from shortlisting matrix for core surgical training? Is that one of the courses you mentioned earlier, Claire? Or exams? So uh, we haven't had the final scoring framework through 
for um, core surgery for review. But I think the understanding of the MDRS recruitment group is that for CT1, ST1 specialties, we shouldn't really be scoring against um, membership exams because a lot of people in foundation will not have the opportunity to sit those at that time or get study leave for it. So I don't think it will be in there, but um, as I said, I haven't seen the final or the final draft yet, so I can't confirm that. OK, thanks. Uh, will ACCS have the same interview for all or will it depend on the theme you choose, such as emergency medicine, anaesthetics or acute medicine? It will depend on stream. So um, you either apply for ACCS emergency medicine and you, you sit that interview or you apply for if, you're, if you want ACCS anaesthetics, you have to apply through the core anaesthetics route um, and it'll be the same interview which you can be considered for both core anaesthetics and ACCS anaesthetics and the same for um, ACCS internal medicine if you apply through the IMT application and then you'll be able to preference either core IMT or um, ACCS internal medicine posts as part of that process. Uh, and linked to that so ACCS uh, I think it's AM is that the same application as IMT and is it included in the IMT competition ratios? Uh, Claire's nodding, so, so it is. Uh, if an international medical graduate is switching training programmes, uh, do they uh, need a crest or, or or is it a letter from the TPD or postgraduate dean if they're applying postgraduate dean if they're applying to a different specialty? So if you're if you're applying for a different specialty, if you're applying for a different specialty at, at CT1 or ST1 that um, need you to prove your foundation competencies. If you're already in a training programme at the point that you apply um, and you hold either a national training number or a deanery reference number, there is no need for you to do anything further at that, at that point in time. It will be deemed that you have satisfied the requirements of foundation competencies previously and therefore don't need to do it again. If you are applying for a higher level training post you, and it's a different specialty, you can just reapply. You don't need anything. You just need to meet the eligibility criteria of that specialty. If you are in a specialty and you're looking to apply for a diff for the same specialty in a different region, there is a form that you need to complete um, just to make your current training programme aware that's what you're doing so they can factor that potential vacancy into their um, vacancy numbers. OK, a further question around the number of vacancies available for each specialty. Is there a date we're hoping to publish the number of posts per region? So there will be indicative numbers available um, at the time that vacancies go live. So um, beginning of November, but as I say, they are indicative. So the, the actual firm vacancy numbers won't be available until nearer the offer date. So normally it's around the middle of February that, that we manage to firm the dates up for, for round one and probably middle of March for, for round two. Uh, just a further Priority question on sort of academic interviews, especially in the surgical specialties. So if they have to sit the MSRA for clinical benchmarking, do they have to score high enough for interview or just pass the, the MSRA? There will be a, a threshold cut score um, that's required for core surgery and they'll need to reach that threshold score. Uh, a couple of questions linked around, uh, will there be more surgical components to the MSRA this year as it's been used for core surgery training? I think it's because the questions are relatively generic. I don't think there'll be, there may already be some specific around surgery, but not more than perhaps there already was. So neurosurgery has been using the MSRA for a number of years anyway. So there will already be um, some questions in there that have been written by surgeons. One of the requirements of joining the MSRA is that the specialty provides item writers for future years. Now, obviously there's not time for, for core surgery to, to participate in item writing for this year because the, the questions go through a series of checks and tests before they're ever put into um, pilot mode or then ultimate test mode. But they will be part of that writing process for future years. But there are already surgical questions in there because neurosurgery have been using the MSRA for I think about six years. Thanks. Uh, uh, an MSRA question again, but this time clinical radiology. Uh, will they be directly offering the top, I think it was 55 applicants last year, or, or has that been removed for 23? We don't know that level of detail at the moment. I think that would depend on cut scores, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, core surgery training, is it a national, a UK wide selection process or are there separate processes for each nation? 
So it's three nation process. Northern Ireland do their own local recruitment um, and follow their own process. But the, the national process will be for England, Wales and Scotland. OK, uh, do all offers for all specialties come out at the same time? So there is a, a deadline date in each recruitment round by which all specialties have to have made their first iteration of offers. But as I mentioned in the, the presentation, if specialties are ready to offer before then, um, they can release them before. But And that's why it's really important that you have a look at the specialty specific guidance because they will give you a date of when they're planning on making their offers. Um, and so you, if they offer at different times and you'd rather wait for an offer from a different specialty, you have the, the opportunity to hold the offer anyway until you hear from somewhere else. Uh, thanks. Uh, what percentage of portfolio and interviews uh, will it be for core surgery? So I think you said it was 10% uh, for the overall score for the MSRA. Do we know the, uh, the breakdown for the other parts of the interview process? It's, if my maths is correctly, it's probably 90% for the multi, uh, including the, the, the interview and the portfolio station, but we don't know the split between them. Yeah, I have a feeling last year it was 60-40 self-assessment, so self-assessment was 40 and 60% interview. Um, I can have a quick look and I should have the answer in about two minutes time. OK, you can always re respond in chat. Thanks, Claire. Is Northern Ireland using uh, for the MSRA for their core surgery training? Um, Northern Ireland aren't one of the nations who partake in the um, national core surgery recruitment, so we wouldn't be able to say. We, the best thing to do would probably be to um, look on their website and I can okay. post the link. Thank you. OK, just looking at some more questions. Uh, if you do an F3 or an F4, could you uh, still apply for ST1 in cardiothoracics and, and core surgery training. So is that a, is there an upper limit to, of experience in core surgery or ST1 cardiothoracic? Uh, Claire? Um, I would advise to have a look on um, the website at the person's, I think there is an 18 month um, upper limit for for experience, but if you look on the website, all the person's specifications are on there and it will tell you on there. Okay. Uh, I am an out of sync foundation trainee due to finish in uh, December. Will that affect my application? Uh, again, is that a similar question, Claire, in regards to person spec? It depends on the reasons why you're you're out of sync. If you're out of sync because of a statutory period um, of leave within your foundation training, then you'll be able to apply for, be appointed to, and delay your entry to specialty training by the same amount of time. So if, for example, you're out of sync because you had six months maternity leave, then you will be able to delay your start date by six months. If it's not for a period of statutory leave and sick leave, parental leave, anything like that, then unfortunately you, you if you're not able to start in August, then you wouldn't be eligible for the posts. OK, thank you, Claire. Uh, uh, someone's asking whether you said there were no interviews for GP and psychiatry for 2023. Yep, that's correct. No interviews for GP and core psychiatry. OK, thank you. Uh, scoring system for core surgery training. Did we have we already answered that one? Uh, Claire? I am just looking now. I'm trying to find the actual percentages. I can't. I can't find them, but we can answer it as one of the questions that we publish um, after the webinar. OK. Uh, further qu a question here around less than full time. Do you do that before or after you accept a post? So you should put it on your application form that you wish to be considered um, and you should also go through the, the mechanism of confirming your eligibility for less than full time um, with your current region. And then if you are appointed to a post, obviously a, 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 you'll be appointed to a full time post and then you can apply to be a less than full time trainee in that post at that point in time. But you need to confirm your eligibility and put it in your application form um, when you apply. Thank you. Uh, the number of posts that are available for individual uh, medical specialties. So indicative posts I think will be available uh, as applications are open, which will be then firmed up as we go through the process and closer to offers. 
obviously competition ratios and the number of posts over the last few years will are already available and will give you a good indication of what to expect in regards to uh, the, the, the vacancies. I now have the core surgery score if you'd like me to give that. So the yeah, please do. 10 percent of the final selection score will be from MSRA. Um, 30 percent will be from the self-assessment and verification and the rest, so 60 percent will come from the interview. Uh, thank you, Claire. Can you explain the 18 months experience for core surgery training uh, and do medical attachments count? So it's any post anywhere in the world, training or service, but um, observer posts, so clinical attachments don't count as part of that that time, but you need to make it clear on your application form that it's an observer post and that you, you didn't have um, hands on training or experience at that time. OK, uh, four minutes to go, so there's any final question. Uh, what's the breakdown for scoring system for radiology? Uh, should, is that published or will soon be published, Claire? It will be published, yes. Yeah, so just need to keep an eye out on the on the specialties website to to find that information. Okay. Does NHS experience help you uh, in applying for applications if you're an overseas medical graduate? Uh, I think we ask for commitment to the specialty, uh, but don't necessarily ask for NHS experience in any person's spec. So. No, that's right. So you you don't have to have NHS experience. But one of the things we will ask you in your application form is if you if it's going to be your first post in the NHS, would you want additional support to help you settle into the NHS? I think one of the things that we've found with some trainees is that um, it's a very different culture to the the health systems that they're they're used to, and so they need some time to settle in. So there's an option there that if you are come into the NHS and it'll be your first post that just make it clear on your application form that you would um, like some additional support if that's what you would want. Uh, someone's just asking, can you confirm the differences if there are if you're not a current trainee at the time of application? Claire? Yeah, so if you're applying for CT1 or ST1 post, there are various ways that you can confirm your um, foundation competencies. They're all in the guidance document, but just for ease here, um, if you're a current foundation trainee, you don't need to do anything else at the point of application. But obviously, you're going to need to have completed foundation successfully and got your FPCC um, before you start. If you have completed foundation in the three and a half years prior to um, prior to commencing the post that you're applying for, then you just upload a copy of your FPCC to your application form um, and don't need to do anything else. If you have completed foundation previously, but your FPCC is signed more than three and a half years before the start date, then you will need to do a crest um, and anybody else also needs to do a crest. The only other um, option for, for not doing a crest and not having done foundation is um, if you're currently in a foundation, uh, currently in a specialty training programme, so you hold either a national training number or a deanery reference number. If you're in that situation, then you'll you will have proven your foundation competencies competencies on entry to that program, and therefore don't need to do it again. But it's all in the guidance documents. So um, rather than just me rabbiting on, you can probably get it from there, and it'll be more succinct. Thanks, Claire. I think we're about at time now for this webinar. Uh, Sonia, I acknowledge that a lot of questions are coming through around the MSRA uh, and core surgery, understandably. So. That we've mentioned there'll be two uh, specific webinars on, on core surgery that will be uh, published over the, the, the next few days. That will include uh, clinical people and recruitment people specifically involved with, with, with core surgery. Uh, we will also uh, publish all the information around the, the selection process for, for core surgery and the evidence of how MSRA has become the, the chosen method for, for shortlisting for, for core surgery. Uh, on our on our website, so it's transparent for applicants to look at, and obviously we'll direct people for all the the wealth of information and uh, and questions that are on the MSRA. That's all, all already there. Any questions that we've not managed to go through? I think there's about 150 that we've had through tonight, so I don't think we've answered all of them. We will put them on a on our website over the next few days uh, and answer them all. Uh, any individual queries any people would like to make to individual recruitment offices, please do that the teams are there ready to help as applications open. 
So uh, thanks to uh, Alana and Claire for answering all, all the questions uh, and thanks for everyone for joining this webinar. It will be on uh, specialtytraining.he.nhs.uk as a recorded, uh, I think, YouTube video, uh, as, and that's where you'll find all the questions. Uh, again, thanks all for your time and uh, have a good evening.